Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And today we're doing the 2012 film, Dread, directed by Pete Travis. And I'm kind of excited for this, because this is both a movie that I picked, that Austin had never seen before, and that he liked, which is a relatively rare occasion around here on the Spectator Film Podcast. So I'm excited to get going on this. It's always a good time when that happens. I think the last time this happened was Tank uh, Tank Girl. Yeah, that was a while ago. <laughs> um also based on a comic book um oh yeah but i'm much much less familiar <laughs> with the dread comic book than i am with tank girl i've read most of uh tank girl i think i have read maybe one issue of judge dread in my entire fucking life so. well i'm glad we're both familiar with the source material as we dive into this commentary track yeah but uh, needless to say as you're introducing this you're more familiar with this movie than i am because as we've said, this is the first time I'm watching it this week. And I'm curious, what made you think to do this for the show this week? Like, is there something we covered recently that kind of compelled you to be like, it's time for a super fascist cop movie? Or what was the deal? <sighs> Not really. <laughs> I wish I could say it's just like, you know, I was reflecting on the state of the highly militarized police in America. And I wanted a movie that, at, on one hand, is a product of the same machine that creates this environment and churns out this fascist propaganda and on the other hand is somewhat of a scathing critique of it and that dichotomy really kind of just makes this movie very interesting and that's why i wanted to do it in the podcast but honestly it was because i was playing a warhammer 40k game and it reminded me <laughs> of this so because they're shooting yeah no well because it <laughs> takes place in the setting where there's judge dread-esque characters in okay, it okay yeah so yeah, that's that's why <laughs> call it divine inspiration. Yes, that? that's that's why I ended up choosing this movie this week. It's not a bad choice, though. I I'm glad I did. I had more fun rewatching it than I thought I would. You know what? Coincidentally, Max, we do live in a p sort of police state with militarized police. Yes. So big coinky dink right there, but it happens to be relevant. <laughs> um, but I take it you like this movie as well. I I really do. I was kind of coerced into watching this movie a year or two ago by my roommate who would not stop talking about how good it was and in my head it kind of like existed in the same space as like the robocop remake or it was just like this like boring soulless action movie that came out around the same time and just missed the point of the story it was trying to tell uh this could not be further from the truth not only is this better than the judge dread movie from the 80s which is just from the, the 90s is it in the 90s yeah whatever the sylvester stallone action vehicle it's like right on the decline of yeah stallone yeah it, it that movie is atrocious this movie has strong performances it makes the most of a relatively small budget for a movie of this size and scope and this some of the lead performances the action and some of the visual effects just really elevate this above what could have just been a boring almost i don't want to say like just a very mediocre action movie yeah a redundant movie a movie that is inseparable from everything else coming up around it like you're saying the robocop movie there's a reason we'd never talk about shit like that because it's just like this stuff is so forgettable you know, of course they made a RoboCop remake. And what other 80s properties have been remade that we just never think about uh, and may as well not exist? You know, um, to the point where it seems like obligatory, where it's like, okay, everything that Hollywood thinks we're nostalgic about is going to be redone and they're going to do it and it's going to be darker and grittier or whatever. Um, and I think that's something, you're hitting on something that I'm really excited to talk about in the commentary track, which is how similar on paper this movie is to so many other movies that are like it, like the RoboCop remake that we just have no interest in talking about that. We have nothing to say about <laughs> movies that are just kind of garbage. Uh, and yet this movie manages to offer there's, there's a spark of life in this movie. It offers something that a lot of those other movies probably don't. Um, and there's a lot of very specific reasons for that, despite their on paper similarities. And it's going to be really fun to talk about um, for my part. I'm glad you finally gave me an excuse to sit down and watch this movie. Uh, this is a movie that I was aware of having a kind of like cult following for a little bit because it didn't do very well, but a lot of people liked it online. And uh, I had been meaning to watch it forever and finally got to sit down and watch it. And uh, there's a lot to enjoy about it. I think it's uh, pretty solid. Um, I, I think the thing about this movie is that it reminds me of the type of uh, sort of classic Hollywood structure where you have that thesis, antithesis, synthesis structure. And, um, you know, like a lot of other movies, it, 
it is going to return us to a status quo at the end of the movie where we have this horrible fascist society. And we've seen the internal contradictions of this, of this ideology that these, uh, our protagonists, the, the judges represent. And yet this movie doesn't really deliver us to a status quo in a really satisfying way at the end. Like we know that the problems aren't going to be solved or whatever, just because they defeated this one gang. Um, and I think the way that it, you know, has that half-assed reconciliation at the end actually really works in its favor. And it, it separates it, like you were saying, that dichotomy you are talking about, where it's part of this machine of uh, rebooting things. And it's this very, like, capital-intensive movie. And yet it also is trying to offer a genuine critique of that. that. That dichotomy, that play between those two things, really exciting part of this movie that a lot of other superhero movies and movies like this don't have. No, that's I, I'm super excited <laughs> to do it. I'm glad that there was more to this movie than I would have thought ever getting dragged into watching it. And we're going to talk about performances later on in the movie, but I do, before we jump in, just want to give a special shout out to Lena Headey in this movie because, God, she's so fucking good. Like, I, I enjoyed Power her. Power actor. I enjoyed her in Game of Thrones even after Game of Thrones got shitty. But so great in this movie and the fact that she shot this in between seasons of game of thrones just a sort of a thing was amazing to me i mean i mean yeah that speaks to how little she had to do to make an impact on the movie yeah she's she really doesn't do a whole lot but she makes the use of every moment she's on screen she's pretty good in this but yeah um unless you and i want to spend the rest of our lives in an iso cube i suggest we hurry this up so what do you say we get going, Austin? Oh, I was going to make a joke that, uh, you know, to any of our listeners listening to this, it might feel like this is taking forever. You know what I'm saying? A little bit of slow-mo there. The movie has started. And here we are. I'm so fucking excited for this guy. <laughs> Man, it's going to be great. This movie is really nice because... Uh, because of its sort of like scale and its scope, it kind of just feels like one long extended sequence once they get in the building. And um, I don't know, it just feels very simple and uh, enjoyable. It's not trying to like hit you over the head with like plot and shit. It's just like, yep, they're in the building and here we go. That's premise and just carry on from there. Now, Max, I, now that we're talking about the scale and the fact that they're trapped in this building, I'm I'm curious. A lot of people will compare this movie to The Raid. Have you seen The Raid? I have. Um I think the raid is probably like all things said and done a better made movie. Okay. Um, but I don't know. I like, I like the hokey sci-fi premise and the dystopian future elements of this, even though it kind of makes it less serious and more hokey. Sure. I I'm going to say, I haven't seen the raid, but I'm going to hypothesize about it. Um, Obviously, knowing what I know about The Raid, it makes sense for people to compare it. They're both movies about, like, police officer characters being confined to a, like, apartment building um, setting and then working their way up and just fighting people in its action. This is a very simple plot, but it's a means to get to the action. And um, it makes sense to me that these two movies would be compared back to back. Uh, And I think I might agree with what you're saying. I expect The Raid probably has more aesthetically interesting action sequences in how they're filmed and executed and choreographed. However, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a more interesting movie. And what this movie has that I don't think The Raid has, I could be wrong, but I don't think it does, is that nexus and that crossover with like superhero movies and that sci-fi stuff, which, again, this movie... Part of what makes it interesting is it's sort of more um, specific ideological take on what superheroes are and uh, this vision of the dystopic future and how those two things work together, you know? And I don't know if the rate hat, it it might have that, but I don't, I'm, you know, I I won't make any assumptions that it does. Um, Obviously, there are two movies that probably you can compare and look at different ways of approaching a similar sort of story. I I completely agree. Also, meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice. Yes. Now, um, I do love how it's just such a contrast between like, there's nothing but chaos, crime and riots and everything are swarming the streets. Welcome to hell. Yeah. And then the Hall of Justice. Well, Max, part of why that establishing shot is so interesting of the giant massive building. I did want to talk about that. um, Of the establishing shot? Yes. uh, I just... I like how effective of filmmaking that is where you get what almost looks like stock footage of a city 
and then you just CGI in these gigantic megastructure apartment buildings. There's so much to talk about in the first opening seconds of this movie. Surprisingly so, because what you're hitting on is really important, I think, to this movie's depiction of the future, and again, how that relates to ideologies of policing and and uh, authority. Um, and like you're saying, hitting on the stock footage, you're talking about the verisimilitude of the images, and then you have these plopped in digital elements. Um, and it's not, when we say they're plopped in, we're not really making comment on whether or not it, it looks like it's out of place or anything. I think it looks fine, technically. Yeah. It's more just that you can tell certain things are not CGI, and then you have these obviously unreal giant buildings. And I think its depiction and its decision to depict the future city in that way is very interesting aesthetically. Um, the first aesthetic thing to know about the Hall of Justice, Max, is how it immediately stands out from all the other buildings around it because it's the only building that looks like a giant sci-fi building. Everything else technically just like kind of looks like a bigger, more labyrinthian um, sort of version of things we might see today. And then look at this highway chase sequence. Nothing is sci-fi about this oh, little, except for Dredd himself. A little trivia I found out here. Yeah? It, it, see, it says Drock on the back of the seat there. Yeah. Drock is a fictional swear word. In the Judge Dredd comic universe. That's stupid. <laughs> they they were going to actually, from what I understand in the original version of the script, they were going to replace all like the swear words with stuff like that, like Drock and whatnot. And then they eventually decided against that. That was a fucking good decision. Yes, it was. <laughs> they decided oh, to throw a little taste in there. And they do that later on in the movie too. There's some references to the series that I found out you know what research, max but. if this movie did everything the same except for that it would have ruined it <laughs> because this movie has to be connected to our real life to have yes. meaning and uh you know just on that note that connection to real life that's another advantage of having this movie in a confined space and a limited scope and scale compared to these other like marvel superhero movies those movies are about like giant space battles and shit happening and it's just kind of like at a certain point it doesn't become human drama Whereas with this, because it's more confined, it's like it's people moving down hallways. It's 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 human action and happening, right? And you can say it's like ridiculous, dirty, hairy stuff, but like it's humans doing things. It's not like starships flying around. Also, I love how accurate of police work that is with rather than stop and try to help the guy who was just hit by a car, he just is like, oh, well, now I have an excuse to kill them all. <laughs> yeah, this uh, this entire opening sequence is very efficient and incredibly well done in establishing um, the way authority works in this world. And again, it can all be traced back as like an extrapolation of how policing works today. Where in this late capitalist society, this late, late, late capitalist society that they're in, where they've descended into full on authoritarianism. Um, you have a situation where like policing does not become there's no, there's not even like a charade where it's about trying to help people anymore. It's the dispensation of violence, you know? Yeah. And, uh, that's why the judges are so intimidating because they represent this kind of like consolidation of due process, um, where they can, you know, sentence people on the spot and they have complete authority, uh, where it's like, that's what this policing has become in this world. Policing has been reduced to its pure function as just being like uh, like the violent arm of the state that at its own will will decide whether or not it's going to like assassinate people. Which gets back to stuff about like slow-mo too that we'll talk about later about, you know, like whether or not slow-mo, like why is it a narcotic? Why is it outlawed? Does it do anything bad? <laughs> as far as we know, slow-mo doesn't have any like negative effects. Why does he care if they're producing slow-mo? Because it's a drug. Right. That's part of this fascist police yes, state. Yes, 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 yes. So it's all like this arbitrary thing that relates back to, uh, you know, state control. God forbid that anybody enjoy themselves in this disgusting megacity. Um, yeah, but to get back to what you were saying earlier, Max, about the uh, sort of composited effect of those big buildings, there's a few interesting things I wanted to touch on. The first one being kind of like, a you know, a little uh, tangent where I think there's a little... I don't know if it's an intentional visual nod, but the opening shot kind of reminds me of the opening shot of uh, Escape from New York, where it like goes up above the wall and then you see the skyline of Manhattan. Yeah. Um, and this one also has that wall with the you know, desert, the cursed earth, he calls it. 
Um, but also if you look at the landscape, I think it's very interesting how they envision the future like graphically. This is not a vertical city. And I think the idea of the city is something that's very important to sci-fi in, you know, dystopian uh, versus utopian um, fiction as well. But like the city is totally horizontal with the exception of these giant mega blocks towers that house like a hundred thousand people. Yeah. And I think it kind of, when I was watching it this week, Max, it kind of reminded me of like them weirdly where it looked kind of like a hive. Yeah, I guess. And you have these giant mega highways. Those are the only like sci-fi things that are overlaid onto this kind of like very recognizable uh, present day setting. That seems like it's just stock footage, right? It's just these big ass highways and these big ass towers. And it just makes it kind of look like this completely, um, this society that's been completely shaped by the forces of like, I don't know, goods moving back and forth. Uh, and there's no sci-fi stuff. There's no cool future aesthetic. It's exactly the same way it is today. And it's total shit. And the only difference is that it's easier for people to move shit around. And then we have to house people in these giant towers. That's it. So it does kind of look hive-like and it's kind of... Um, I don't know. It, it has a more interesting flavor than a type of city with a recognizable skyline. You know, this is an urban environment, but it doesn't feel like a city. It just feels like the landscape has been completely replaced with machinery and buildings. You know, like there's no identifiable skyline or city center or, an, or anything. It's just urban space. Carl, urban space. You might say. Like so urban. <laughs> also, I love the fact that, listen, I. Like I said, neither of us are very familiar with the Judge Dredd comics. No. But I love the fact that they're just like, oh, there are mutants, by the way. This girl can read people's minds. Yeah. Don't, don't worry about it. We're not going to make a big thing about it. We're not going to go into like this whole... <sighs> and listen, there there would be a movie that... This, like, the whole thing would be like, mutants are an oppressed underclass and this girl joining the police force because of her special thing is what is going to show that mutants can be good at just as good as everybody else and stuff like that. But like this movie doesn't need that. Right. Well, this, this movie recognizes what her mutant abilities are. And also like it's, it's focused enough to understand that you don't need to go into some sort of indulgent, stupid thing, giving us exposition about like how the mutants work. It doesn't matter. <laughs> She's a mutant. That's it. That's all that matters. I think we've talked about this previously on the show, but I'm very anti-world building in most cases because I think it's just an excuse to be lazy and stupid and not tell a story. It's like, okay, you just came up with something and now you're vomiting it on me. It's like, yes, but what about the mutant? You know, this movie cuts out the world building. And it's just like, it's there's mutant. Shut up. <laughs> And because it's focused on trying to do something, it's it works. It's like, okay, there's mutants. I don't care. I don't need to know, you know, that they have like a fucking 25th chromosome or whatever. Doesn't matter. It was a result of the third nuclear war in the year 2072 <laughs> yes. when Mega City 2 decided to bomb Mega City 1. <laughs> yes. and the resulting, uh, no. It doesn't wrong. matter at all. It's not important. Um, what is important is Lena Headey, who is yes. being introduced here as Mama. What do you think about her introduction scene? Um, a lot of the slow-mo scenes were specifically done for 3D. Yes. And they show. But it's it's a beautiful scene. Um, from what I understand, a lot of the slow-mo effects were added after in post-production to try to spice up the movie okay. a bit. Um, and I guess we should talk about that a bit. The fact that this movie is... I don't want to talk over Lena Headey's introduction, though. We'll get into this. But th there was... You're talking about the production drama? Yes. There was a lot of production drama behind this movie and the reason why the listed director is not the real auteur behind this film. But in terms of acting, I think Lena Headey is better than anybody in this movie. She's intimidating effortlessly. She... And humanizing. Humanizing at the same time. She's yeah. like, I mean, she's a comical villain. She has people fucking skinned alive and thrown off a building to send a message. But like. But the idea that it doesn't feel comical yes. is where the acting comes in. And that's the that's the difference that it makes, you know. Um, and I think she's the perfect foil to 
Carl Urban. Yes. They don't have scenes together. Until the very end of the movie. Yeah, but somehow it does feel like they have a form of chemistry, which is weird, um, where they're just sort of going back and forth, and yet they both seem somewhat uh, similar in certain ways. Uh, I really appreciate her performance here, and I appreciate the filmmaker's willingness to um, have not just her, but also, you know, Carl Urban and our other main characters, but mostly Lena Headey, uh, not have to exposit anything about themselves or how they're feeling or their backstory, much like the stuff with the psychic. It's like, we're just going to give the actor space to play it how they want to play it, and we don't have to explicitly comment on what's going on inside their head. Um, but because we have faith in our actors, we know that they're going to give a compelling performance and it's going to give our audience space to recognize something in the emotions they're expressing or not expressing. And uh, I think that for movies like this, that's always the smarter decision because it gives you space to, um, first of all, gives talented actors like Lena Headey space to make their own creative decisions and really express the character how they want to do it. And they don't have to like subordinate themselves to some stupid plot that they have to explain to the audience every five minutes. But also it's like, it's giving you as an audience member uh, more space to participate in like figuring out exactly what's going on under the skin of these different characters. And there's a number of different moments like that. Uh, I think one that really sticks out to me is a moment we'll get to later where Judge Dredd is about to die right and something that we were we've been thinking about all week is like is he actually scared in that moment if you over explain your character you don't get to have that question <laughs> you know but this movie maintains that question and it actually supplies you with a really interesting moment that you usually wouldn't get in a movie like this in a dumb remake movie yeah i you you had an interesting term for like a readaptation of this because it, it, it doesn't have to do with anything with the yeah, Stallone one. That's another thing. It's kind of like, a oh, what's that movie? The PC future movie with Stallone as well. Um, PC future demolition man. Yeah. Um, where like that movie has an interesting sci-fi premise and then it just devolves into a Sylvester. Taco Stallone. Bell. Yeah. So <laughs> that's fine. I'm fine with that. That's the fun stuff in that movie. But like when it devolves into a Sylvester Stallone, you get in a Baja blast. Yeah. Oh, Baja blast you out. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the chalupa. And of course, you wouldn't have cops without hassling a homeless person. Homeless drunk, you will debase self for credits. <laughs> for space bucks. We're not just doing this for money. <laughs> We're doing it for, for a shitload, shitload of money. money. It would have been great if one of the other judges said that at the end <laughs> <laughs> they're having second thoughts after dread kills two of them. <laughs> one of the judges is barf yeah. with the fucking like dog tail coming out behind their armor <laughs> uh, i love how that's like one of mel brooks's like lesser movies and it's still infinitely quotable it's because mel brooks is so committed to doing stupid things in his movies that it kind of transcends what it's doing even if it's not a good movie like the joke where they're like comb the desert and they have a giant comb yeah it's like that is so stupid <laughs> and yet somehow i like it i don't know how that works it's the magic of mel brooks he's got like pixie dust <laughs> now max something i didn't mention earlier relating again to the uh the stakes that are established by having a smaller scope uh, relates to the actual effort they put into having physical corpses in this. They have like some CGI blood that they use a lot, but we'll get to that. Um, but I really appreciate how in the opening sequence where he's chasing those people and when they hit that guy, they ha have a really good dummy that they hit and they actually provide you with a physical corpse because it really, <laughs> it really like hammers home the type of violence that you're going to be seeing in this movie. Um, and they do it again here with these like, pancake people who fell like a thousand stories where you can tell it's a physical prop and it kind of looks gross. So uh, I think that's a really good touch because it lets you, it sort of earns you uh, a certain like force and impact to the violence later on. You know what I'm saying? Especially the guy who gets hit by the car. He's just walking down the street and then it becomes this really violent thing because they have a dummy there. Because why not? And also, we have to show how violent and fucked up the future is. 
But again, I, I think I'm differentiating like that moment from movies that are like this, but not as good, where if you didn't care as much, you wouldn't get a physical dummy or whatever. You would just animate a CGI thing. But having something in the sort of my, like material plane that you can see, an actual dummy, really gives force to the violence and allows um, the violence in this movie to have consequences, more so than other movies of this ilk. And I can already tell we're going to be comparing. We're going to be talking about how this movie is not like other movies similar to it a lot. Um, so hopefully that won't get too old to listeners. But I think it's true. You might get similar moments in other movies, but the aesthetic is going to be different. And I think it's going to lessen the impact. <laughs> oh, God, I love the judge. They look like they're right out of the Warriors. In terms of just... Yeah, it is funny how they have, like, the gritty shit in this, and then they still go, like, oh, no, we're going to have, like, Warriors-esque gang <laughs> members with, like, massive tattoos on their head. That's That has got to be the worst gang to be a part of. Can you imagine how much of a pain in the ass it would be to maintain those tattoos? And then get... All over your head? Yeah, and then fucking get your gang torn apart by somebody named... Yeah, part of the Mama clan. The Mommy clan. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, that would be terrible. Which gang do you think you would be a part of? Would you be one of the judge people? I mean, I do have a appreciation for like the over the top warriors commitment to a gimmick. So, so yeah. you would tattoo a whole yeah. judge thing on top. Listen, of your if I'm living in this fucking shit thing where my life expectancy is 30. Sure. Why not? <laughs> I'm going to make myself like a fucking GTA character. <laughs> Whatever. I'll do some slow-mo out of a fucking glass inhaler. <laughs> so, Max, another way in which this movie separates itself from other similar movies is in the slow-mo and its use of 3D, which you already mentioned was, you know, done in post to, you know, maybe add some spice to the movie. And I think it's aesthetically very beautiful the way they do it. But it's not just the way they do it that's interesting. It's the way it actually plays a role in, like, the formal organization of the movie. So if we look at like 3D in action movies of this ilk, right? What are the what's its like legacy? What's its uh what's its ancestry, its lineage? Obviously the biggest moment for this type of 3D would be the Matrix, right? And if we think about it in that, it is definitely mostly in a an aesthetic flourish. Yeah. Um but it also has a relation to the action where it's like it's giving you a new perspective on the action. We don't just slow down. We The camera moves around and we get a new perspective, right? And it relates to the characters moving so quickly that, you know, we slow down time to get this unique, like, aesthetic experience on what's happening. In this movie, it's slightly different. It's also a purely aesthetic experience, but it has no relationship to the action at hand, you know? We don't go into slow motion because someone's about to be kicked. It's entirely plot-motivated. Um... And part of why that's interesting is because it, it disembodies it from like the way slow motion would usually be used in an action movie. I mean, this movie comes out only a few years after like fucking 300 with the speed ramping and that shit. Oh, God. You know what I'm talking about? Where it's like that is not motivated by the movie. That's an, ex an aesthetic like decision they're making, but it still relates back to the action. The slow-mo in this does not relate back to the action. It only relates back to the plot device of the, them using the drug. And because of that, there's this interesting pattern that forms, specifically starting with this scene, where slow-mo starts to be used as something that we see when people are about to be horribly victimized and uh, like assaulted or murdered. It's used to accentuate violence. Yes. Uh, and instead of something that is meant to aesthetically like portray um, characters enacting violence, it's something that becomes an aesthetic touch to people being destroyed by the violence of dread, mostly. And of course, just on a technical level, when they add the sort of, um, you know, drug filter that they have here with the slow-mo, it does allow them to get away with the uh, digital blood splatter a lot better than they would otherwise because you can tell that it looks slightly different and it just makes it sit in the composition a lot better. Yeah. So it's a way of having their cake and eating it too where it's like, okay, we're not going to spring for money. 
where we get, you know, uh, um, uh, what are they called? The blood splatter things. Squibs? Squibs, yes, thank you. Where they're not going to get squibs for every single scene, but like we can have these digital blood splatters and it won't look terrible because we can, we can nest it inside this uh, drug vision that we have. And that will make the artificiality of it look okay. It'll make it seem natural. But the other interesting thing about Slow Mo Max is that unlike the Matrix, where it's very much an objective perspective on the action, slow mo is not just slow motion. It is also something where the camera takes on a subjective point of view because it is a drug and because it must enter the mind of the person who's taking it, which is interesting. So it's not just that, you know, it, it becomes associated with the judges like enacting horrible violence on these people when they take slow mo. It is uh, something that we experiencing we experience it alongside the victim rather than an objective perspective. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh. For any of the Star Wars fans who somehow haven't stopped listening to our podcast years. Domhnall Gleeson, the one black mark in this movie. Oh, he's he's good in this movie. Nah, he's just whatever. He's good. No, he's not. He's fine. He's not good. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of scenes, and he's there to be fucking nervous and terrified of Mama. That's that's his entire character. I'm not really a Domino Gleason uh, head. Neither am I. I. I just think he's good in this movie. I, I don't. I, I didn't realize it was him until I was look, just looking at the IMDb page. I'm like, oh, that is him, huh? That doesn't speak very well to his performance, does it, Max? No, it's just that he's covered in makeup and has longer hair. He's not covered in makeup. Yeah, he's he's got contacts. He's got contacts, and they you put makeup on him to make him look extra pale, like a tech goblin. All right, fine. Agree yeah. to disagree. It should have just been Lena Hetty again, playing this guy. <laughs> just Lena Hetty as every member of the Mama. <laughs> just a bunch of Lena Hetty's. <laughs> Now, Max, I don't exactly understand this part of the movie. So, because they have to take over the control room because she realizes, okay, for anyone not watching this, the judges have just done a drug bust. Anderson and Dredd have done a drug bust and they've arrested the character K, who has all the inside information about how this building, Peachtrees, is the distribution center and the production center for slow mo across the entire city. Uh, and Mama does not want. K to walk out of the building with the judges because she knows when they interrogate him, he will spill everything. He's a snitch. So in order to keep the judges in the building, uh, the gang members launch an assault on some sort of municipal control room where they now have access over the entire building. The weird thing to me, Max, is like, it just seems weird. Like, they, they didn't have access to that already. Like, I thought they owned the building. They do, but like... I think that's a very specific thing. And like you see them torturing Donald Gleason in the past in one of the psychic flashbacks. So I'm assuming that she had him on retainer specifically for tech issues like this. So it doesn't really matter. You don't want I mean, yeah, it's just a nitpick, but you, it, you don't want to draw judges to your building if you already basically own it. So you don't need to kill like the five remaining government employees still working there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if I'm just making my nitpick, it's like, wouldn't she just like pay them or something? Just pay them like a little, like a little bribe money. And then they basically work for her now. <laughs> um, this movie isn't necessarily a perfect movie. And I think there's signs of different cracks and crevices in it that have those moments, but because it has like kind of, it has a specific focused goal that it's reaching toward. I think it, you know, it doesn't really matter. Transcends past that. Oh, God. It's bold of... You're headed for the cubes. <laughs> What's something funny is that, uh, from what I understand, Carl Urban never took off his helmet during filming he went full uh full, full method yes uh, how do we know it was actually carl urban in there that's true he what if it was, what if it was carl suburban 
I hope you're proud of that one. I really <laughs> hope you are. I wonder how many times he's heard that joke in his life. Carl Rural. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, he maintained his American accent the entire way through filming, didn't smile the entire way. Um, I also know that he did most of his own stunts. All of the motorcycle stuff is him, and a lot of the action scenes are him as well. So good on him for that. Pretty good. I'm sticking with that the entire time. But you said that you didn't believe that she hadn't uh, just taken over this entire building and the few remaining government employees in it, especially since she does hire judges later on in the movie. Yeah. I don't believe that this dystopian fascist society would invest so heavily in war protections (laughs) for their civilians. That's true. There are questions about this that you can kind of pick at because the movie doesn't bother to give you answers. And I, to be honest, even if you kind of don't, even if you feel incredulous about different elements in this movie, I appreciate that it actually doesn't answer it because it's more interesting to just think about it even if you feel like it, it's just a plot hole or something. But regardless, Max, I think one of the key things of the aesthetic of this building, whether you buy it on a literal level or not, is that they're definitely trying to communicate one of those key police state, uh, you know, uh, uh, dystopian elements of the elimination of the difference between private and public space. And that's why this militarized bunker building totally works with that. And it's something that you're going to see repeated throughout almost every scene in this movie when they're trapped in this building, where it's like, you know, when you have figures of absolute authority like the judges, and then you have figures of resistance like Mama, who also exercise absolute authority through their performance of violence. Um, The difference between private and public space no longer matters because you're fully subject to surveillance and you're fully subject to the whims of whatever authoritarian force happens to control your specific area. You know, like, no one could look at Judge Dredd if he's, like, knocking on their door and be like, no, you can't come in. You know? The idea of them having their own private space where they could refuse a judge doesn't exist in this. And that's something interesting about the Cassandra character is how her mutant powers, um, she's really like the ultimate tool. The ultimate form of government surveillance. Yeah. Where she doesn't even have to interrogate them, but she can just be like, you're guilty, I know. You know? Yeah. And one thing that I really like about this movie is how it allows her to engage with her own powers in that specific way. And then it does not shy away from punishing her for, for being a fascist cop, you know, when she kills that guy and he's like, he's just standing there and he's definitely not a danger to them anymore. And she just shoots him in the head. That is definitely like 100% an evil thing to do. No. And that's the thing. Like normally, and we've gone over this before in the like almost like buddy cop movies we've done before, is you, for these kind of movies, you strive for a synthesis of the two characters, basically. The hard ass gets a little more, okay, I remember what it was like to be an easy guy. You got the guy who's by the book and then the one who's a loose cannon. Yeah. Yeah. And, And they learn from each other and they both become better people from it. In this, um... Carl Urban's character development is to learn that it's okay to bend the rules if it's ultimately for the benefit of the fascist police state will make it more effective. Yeah, it's kind of... um, And (laughs) his partner's character growth is to learn to be more of a murderer. More jaded. Yeah. Yeah. Where clearly it looks like she's going to quit at the end of the movie. And then you just see her silhouette still going at the end. Where it seems like she's kind of lost herself. And she's like, well, fuck it. I don't know. But Max, I'm glad you bring that up. Because that again relates back to that like thesis, antithesis, synthesis, synthesis structure. Which I think is very clearly epitomized by these buddy cop movies. You know? Um, Because you have each character as like a personification of those different ideologies and arguments. And again, like you're saying, this movie does sort of deliver you back to a status quo that's been reinforced at the end of the movie. Um, But it doesn't do so in a very convincing way because it's so compellingly and strongly puts the characters 
throughout the middle part of the movie, it's situations where their ideology is shown to be completely contradictory and irreconcilable with actual ideas of justice and fairness and equality. And again, that gets just that just gets back to the Cassandra character, you know, th- them giving her the space to actually experience the full consequences of her actions and not shying away from it. It's totally appropriate that they put her in a situation where she has to confront, you know, the now widow of the man she murdered in, in cold blood after he was already defeated. In this scene, he'll be defeated. Yeah. And then even more so, Max, uh, the way in which they provide her with kind of like that moment, I don't know if you would call it cowardice, where she doesn't say anything either to the widow. Right? We, okay, here she's about to shoot him. Yeah. Where we leave that widow character and the widow is none the wiser that her husband is dead or her boyfriend or whatever. Her baby daddy. Her whatever, yeah. She did it. Her what? hair is amazing for considering what's going on. <laughs> effortlessly wavy not a hair out of place she's always looking perfect for the gram yeah i mean it, you joke max but that's kind of like <laughs> that's kind of like the way those like idf women who oh, post yeah. <laughs> like honeypot shit on like twitter or whatever to just like thirst trap people um and they're always wearing like military gear and they're like oh i feel so sexy about to murder some palestinians <laughs> Now, Max, the other interesting thing that this movie does, getting back to that idea of um, the performance of violence being a key part of these uh, two judges and what they do here, is how uh, it uses the Judge Dredd character and the the sort of plot contrivance of this being an evaluation and an assessment to see whether or not Cassandra passes as a judge to continually reinforce and then offer uh, moments for this harmful, evil, fascist ideology to express itself in their behavior. Right. Because she has to meet the grade. And uh, that's why she does evil things like that. So her performing is meeting a test. So it completely um, enforces the idea that it's like, oh, this is not about policing. This is about performing violence to let people know who's boss. This is what authority has been reduced to in this system. Execute him. He's like, oh, you can't execute somebody on a 99% certainty. Sure you can. I believe this state would execute somebody on a 2% certainty. Was he 90, Was he 100% certain when he said the guy made the mistake about the 1024 call? The uh, corrupt judge? And he's like, you didn't say there were two of us. Yeah. And then he immediately busts his, like, Adam's apple. <laughs> Literally <laughs> like, just... What if you were wrong, Inverses dude? his throat. What if he just, like, misspoke? What if he was up for like 48 hours? And he's just like, oh yeah, I've just been killing people for like... What if he was a big fan of yours? And he was nervous. Yeah. Yeah. Because the other judge knows Dredd. We, yeah. We find out. He's like, like, you've killed way more people than I am. Can I get your autograph? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> can sign my nutsack or something? I don't give a shit about your fucking probably gonna fail apprentice today. <laughs> You're the best murder cop in the world. I don't care how good her, her hair is. <laughs> Oh, this is depressing. What is depressing? The upcoming baby mama scene. It's just such a good moment. This is what we need more from like any sort of studio movie um, where you allow characters to feel consequences for their actions. So many movies have characters enacting violence like this, but they don't actually like really examine the repercussions of it at all. And I'm sure some idiot who might be listening to this would point to something like Marvel Civil War, which I haven't seen, but I'm going to make assumptions about and talk about anyway. Uh, I assume that that movie ultimately has to let off the hook everything those characters are doing because every other Marvel movie lets them off the hook. I'm not talking about like the literal violence they cause, but the idea that they're causing violence 
in the name of like the state, because that's what superheroes are at their most fundamental level. Every superhero is basically Charles Bronson. If you think about it from death wish, that's what they are at their core. They're vigilantes. They're like right wing Avengers. That's what superheroes are. Um, and what this movie does is it's just honest about the political implications of what they're doing. You know, it understands that like superheroes are kind of like just an offshoot of Dirty Harry. And because other movies that are similar to it simply don't acknowledge that and try to pretend that, you know, superheroes are fighting on behalf of some sort of like objective good that exists beyond the political system they're in. Uh, it makes them <laughs> complicit in reinforcing that and makes them kind of like evil, <laughs> in my opinion. And you say she faces the consequences of her actions, but she really doesn't. She's just like, oh, the person I killed out of family. Oh, well. I'm just saying, the like, materially, there aren't any consequences. But emotionally, this character is not allowed to continue the illusion that she's, like, a just, good person. Yeah. Just shooting off video game characters. Yeah. She knows she did not have to kill that guy, and she knows that the only reason she shot him in the head while he was begging for help bleeding on the ground was to impress her fascist uh, cop boss. She knows that. She knows there was no good reason to kill him, and that because of that, she is a, not a good person. And even if there's no material consequences for it, it's more of a moment than you would get from other movies. I do love Carl Urban's face. <laughs> there's something about it that's very, uh, the way he plays the character with, with just his chin, there's something kind of tongue in cheek about it too. Yeah. That he, he understands how to play it with a, with a conspicuous level of seriousness, but also a level of seriousness that I think deliberately allows you to laugh at it at different moments. <laughs> just his scowl is so prominent. It's kind of like funny. It's good. I think Carl Urban totally understands the tone he needs to go for with this material. Because again, isn't something about these fascist super cops also that they're kind of completely vulnerable to comedy? Yeah. At well, a certain point, well, when that's the problem with fascist in general is it's like, it's brought down so quickly by ridicule because it takes itself way too serious. Yes. And also it has to take itself seriously because again, what are we talking about? It's the idea of performing violence to enforce authority. So all you have is that performance of violence. So he has to be serious because that's the role he has to play in order to maintain this facade of, of having some sort of actual authority in this place. Because obviously this fucking government does nothing for these people. These people have no reason to listen to anything that these people say, that the government agents say. All these government agents do is come in and kill people. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing. Like earlier on in the film, Dredd is talking to the medical examiner guy and is just like, Oh, why haven't you reported this? Like, do you have any idea how often we actually get a fucking judge up in this place? Yeah. It's like, no, has the government ever sent a social worker as the government's building? <laughs> Does anyone in this building have health care? Probably not, because it says there's 96% unemployment. <laughs> 2% of those are bureaucrats and 2% of those are cops. Well, it says that like the majority of the floors are classified as slums. So I, I assume the employment is just like, I don't know. Being uh oh and uh, peach trees you mean yeah oh then it's that one medical examiner and everybody who works for mama <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting you say that too because I think it's compelling to look at the detail of ninety six percent unemployment also as like an official statistic compared to actual you know unclassified or uncategorized forms of work that are just not recognized by the state or whatever. That's a way in which I would say this movie reinforces certain uh, perceptions of this type of aesthetic and, and the idea of like the third worldification of this country where it's like 96% unemployment and treating that as like an objective 
uh, metric for looking how this like ecosystem of this building actually works. So like, clearly money is being exchanged here. People live somehow. Yeah, that's the it's just beyond the realm of what you're measuring, you know, with your your official metrics. But again, that's the situation that these people in this building are in. They can't rely on the state for any sort of support at all. So they have to, even though they live physically within the confines of the city, they have to try to eke out an existence that's like outside the system. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So one other thing I wanted to say earlier about uh, just the general sci-fi aesthetic and the way that this movie plays with it is uh, talking about those differences between like a utopian aesthetic and a dystopian aesthetic. Okay. And I think the primary thing that I've noticed in how sci-fi movies portray this is that in the utopian aesthetic, you have a lot of smoothness, a lot of like chrome. Think 2001, right? That's the vision of the future that's utopian. Um, aesthetically, at least in terms of the design of the sets and everything. It's very smooth. It's very um, glossy, you know? And I think, and the opposite holds true for dystopia. But I think the thing that really is at the core of this difference is like in the utopian aesthetic, the it's kind of like commodity fetishism. The, uh, the means of production of whatever com- commodity it is that is being aestheticized is hidden. Right, So in a utopian aesthetic, you would have a hologram because there's no physical interface. The, com- the commodity you're interacting with has no physical material existence that you can interact with. The hologram is the ultimate fetishized commodity because its production is completely invisible. You don't know how it's made. You know? You're like, the hologram just magically exists. Uh, whereas in a dystopia, and as a side shoot of that, uh, cyberpunk universes, the production of things is highlighted. And that's what's happening in this movie, too, where you have in this throughout this building, you see all these pipes and everything running around it. The building, if you look at it as a commodity, does not hide its construction at all behind the walls. You can see that it's like, oh, this is a vent shaft. This is for gas. This is for water, whatever it is. The production is entirely visible. You know what I'm saying? Or you look at the bars on the window, right? If this was a utopian aesthetic, you wouldn't need bars on the window because the function of preventing people from breaking through your window would be handled by like some sort of magical uh, indestructible glass. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, the interesting thing is, though, that the dystopian aesthetic is not the only thing that appears in this movie. The one thing that is utopian in its aesthetic and very sci-fi in its aesthetic is the judges, their vehicles, their weapons. They're very sleek. Uh, They're very um, sort of geometrically symmetrical. And if you look at their guns, right, what happens with their guns? We don't know how it happens. It seems like magic, but the guns have a bunch of different, like, settings and modes that they can alter to and their voice activated, right? The material uh, production of how their guns work is kind of, like, masked and hidden from us. So they're the ones with the sci-fi aesthetic. Everybody else is still using fucking... 2000s equipment basically not even 2000s equipment max it's like everyone else is stuck in this image that americans have of like the worst part of like favelas in brazil yeah or any you know place where there's rampant poverty uh in in like the global south or whatever and we're just talking over this scene where people get fucking brutally murdered by these machine guns this is a fun scene though I have to be honest, I was not expecting this to happen. (laughs) Just the endless carnage. And once again, we arrive at a situation where the, uh, the actions of the judges approach comedy where it's like, if you, if you're still clinging to this idea that they're like police officers trying to enact some form of judgment or uh, justice, it's just like, he gets hundreds and hundreds of people (laughs) murdered. (laughs) He's just like, Oh fuck, I better run. Too bad about all those other people who can just get ruthlessly murdered by Mama with these Gatling guns. I mean, it's comical. Yeah. (laughs) It's just like, good job. 
dread. You just killed like a thousand people. <laughs> like, I don't know what it is. I could just totally see that moment being played by like fucking Buster Keaton or something where he's like, oh, fuck, I better run. <laughs> and then just all the walls start exploding around him and everyone dies. The end. <laughs> yes. Man, they're really lucky they landed on the skate park. It's really good they let these kids back in. <laughs> They've just been fucking... They can't stop skateboarding. They've been doing it for hours. <laughs> it's the only thing I can do. Max, I was actually going to ask you, like, what would you be more annoyed by in this movie? Would you rather be trapped outside the building when the lockdown goes into effect, or would you rather be inside? I mean, I'd probably want to be with those skateboarders, honestly. I have less of a chance of being mowed down by machine gun fire. But is it worth the inconvenience of 12 hours of being outside? Of having to skateboard constantly. For entertainment, that's the only thing you can No, do. not even for entertainment. You just have to. In this dystopian society, the, there's automatic turrets on the skateboarding ramp. That <laughs> if you stop? If you stop skateboarding, they'll just fucking execute you. You have a certain minute uh, uh, quota of skateboarding you have to perform in order to have access to the skateboarding park. Exactly. Mandatory fun. <laughs> are are there any movies about that idea of mandatory fun? That's like the next step our corporate culture is going to take, right? We've gotten to like replacing spirituality with corporate culture where it's like you're going to do yoga, like hot yoga at work and talk about like spiritualism of like filling out Excel spreadsheets. But like, I don't know, the despair cube is like... Oh, the Amazon thing? Yeah, that's like the most on the nose, like satire is dead thing. The history of existence. Yeah. How long will it take before someone just kills himself in, in the spare cube? cube? Yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't imagine that long. People already die in Amazon work yeah, warehouses all the time. But what, what do you think the next thing will be where it's like mandatory fun and people have to start uh, pretending to have fun at work. Otherwise they're going to get fired. Yeah. go back in okay uh, i think now is as good a time as any to sort of talk about the in between conflicting auteur theory that i have for this the movie. production stuff of this yes i don't know if i would agree that this movie's made by an auteur but um go ahead i i would you can you can not like his movies but i think that i don't think you're talking about alex garland yes. specifically in in the drama surrounding this production i don't know if alex garland has like a definitive like style or like you know subject matter that he returns to that would make him like an auteur uh like maybe he's more technically competent and skilled than some other directors but i don't know if he's like you can see in an alex garland movie and you're like oh yeah high concept sci-fi i would say but sure an interest in sci-fi yes can i don't know if that makes him an auteur it's certainly perhaps more of a notable authorial voice though at the very least We'll agree with that. Yes. So, but if you look this movie up, you'll see uh, Pete Travis as the director of this movie. Um, Pete Travis is mainly a work for hire director. He's done a couple of other movies, but none of them are particularly high budget or well known. He's done more like yeah, made for TV movies and TV shows and whatnot. And that kind of baffled me when I first found out because I'm like, this movie is interesting enough and well done enough and has enough stylistic flair that I would figure this guy would go on to do more stuff. And then I started looking deeper into the production. And the first thing I found was an interview with Carl Urban, how he said that Pete Travis was not really the director of this movie and it was Alex Garland. But from what I understand, Pete Travis did finish a version of this movie and the producer's, and just basically the executives thought it was such garbage that they basically cut him out of the rest of the movie. And Alex kind of stepped up in the post-production and reshoot process to turn the movie into what it really is today. Do we have a strong like post-mortem on like the whole process or any, is there like a good article that we can link to or something? I don't know. Cause people like this movie online. You would think there would be some sort of retrospective. That's like, here's what happened with the production of dread. 
et cetera, et cetera. I had to piece it together for multiple different sources. I will send you the link to the uh, interview I found with Carl Urban. That's the weird thing about the budget of this movie, too, where if what you're saying is true and they had to do reshoots, right, or there was any sort of disruption to the production because, you know, uh, the director left or departed or whatever the fuck that happened, right, that totally would inflate the budget. Um, Where this budget, I, I think the budget is listed online as in the range of 30 to $45 million. Um, and if you watch the movie, you might not really think that that's represented on screen. But it still might be the case if there were reshoots because of how expensive that gets. How quickly and how expensively that becomes, you know? So here's the other interesting thing that I think we can compare to this movie's use of slow-mo, right? Um, the only other part of this movie where you really enter a character's subjective, like subjective space like this and how it influences the aesthetic of the movie is when we're entering Cassandra's head when she's doing her psychic stuff. So in that way, it is vaguely comparable to the slow-mo, at least aesthetically speaking. Except now it's not being done as a way to try to escape the everyday pain of <laughs> fascist society. It's done as an extension of the fascist tool. I mean, I guess slow mo is utilized in that movie, in this movie, as that well, because anybody who takes it is going to die in excruciating violence ten seconds later. Yeah, I slow mo is interesting. I think on that note, actually, I might have some quotes that oh. we can read. Another bit of trivia. What? That American flag back there? What? It has six stars, which is a reference to the Dread comic. Uh, the only thing that's left of the United States of America is there are six megacities left, and that's it. I thought it was one megacity. No, this is Mega City one. Um, which I thought it was one city with a bunch of districts. There's a bunch of districts in this megacity, but there are six megacities across the entire United oh, States. Oh, okay. This is Mega City one from Boston to Washington, D.C., So, Max, speaking of the slow-mo, I'm going to quote from an essay called Cities on the Edge of Time, the urban science fiction film by Vivian Subject. Uh, Great, great uh, scholar, I think. I really like her work. Um, But this passage passage is basically speaking to a specific type of movie uh, from the 80s that embraces the cyberpunk aesthetic, relating again to that idea of materiality that I brought up earlier. Um, And what Vivian Subject does in this essay is she talks about how uh this sort of cyberpunk aesthetic is something that is also a fantasy projection that kind of doesn't really escape uh the throes of neoliberalism or you know late capitalism but it just fantasy projects a reversal of it so uh she writes that um what results from mass this mass bourgeois abandonment of the city however is a peculiar and hallucinatory screen liberation of those quote unquote others left behind I'll interject here, the people who are othered in different versions and iterations of the city. So often that's going to be the racialized other, right? But the people who are marginalized who then become the center of sci-fi stories and sci-fi fiction in the uh, cyberpunk um, aesthetic and universe. So she continues later on, uh, let loose and left to their own devices in a city which now has no center and no constraints, which has been junked rather than urbanly renewed, this newly dominant and diverse population energizes and reformulates the negative and nihilistic urban values of the 1960s and 1970s as sublimely positive. In a complete reversal, the imaginary science fiction city's lowness, baseness, horizontality, its overcrowdedness, its overpopulatedness, and overstuffedness are celebrated and aestheticized. But this total and concrete resignation to the city's debasement results in a positive, symbolic uh, re-signing. The junkyard, the dump, the trashy edges of the town are culturally re- reinscribed as a novel and exotic urban space that eroticizes and fetishizes material culture that is valued for its marvelously unselective acquisitive power, its expansive capacity to accumulate, consume, and contain things, anything, its existential status as an irrefutable testimony to the success of mere material production. So that's a you know waterfall of words, but like basically it's talking about how in cyberpunk, a lot of what that fiction is defined by is how people are redefining their relationship to commodities, right? Repurposing them, retooling them, 
using them to quote unquote hack the system, you know, and commodities and junk, the accumulation of junk of things in those, you know, cyberpunk cities becomes a way for marginalized people to resist, you know, the powers that be. This movie, however, does not allow for that. Um, and the part I want to go back to, too, is when she calls it a peculiar and hallucinatory screen liberation. The reason why it's hallucinatory is that idea that it's like, in order for that to happen, in order for people to repurpose the commodities in that way, there has to be a vacation of like the forces of capital that actually create them and occupy that space uh, to begin with. And uh, it's just it just doesn't work that way in real life. So I think that's something that connects to like the slow-mo. What is it? It's a thing that they're producing to make money. It's a narcotic. We don't know anything about it other than like it's a way of making money that is outlawed by the government and yeah. the powers that be. And what is it? It's literally that hallucinatory, uh, you know, kind. That's the closest they experience to like an actual sci-fi aesthetic. You know what I'm saying? Otherwise, it looks completely normal, like, every day. The people who work for the fascist government, they get the sci-fi bikes, they get the sci-fi guns and outfits. Everyone else, what do we have? We have slow-mo. That's the closest we can get to that cyberpunk thing. And what does it become? It becomes a thing that is just shattered when the fascist super cops show up and say no. And instead of it being something that is potentially this liberating thing, uh, it becomes something that uh, just signifies that you're going to become a victim of horrible police violence. Sorry, I had to pause for Lena Headey being back in the movie. Do you like her in any other movies? Um, I'm really only familiar with her work from Game of Thrones, honestly. Not the Brothers Grimm? I forgot that movie existed. <laughs> oh my god! Or uh, three hundred. I I don't like three hundred in general. Really, you don't like three hundred? We've watched it together. You know I don't like it. I know. I was trying to <laughs> lead to a joke. Max, what do you think about uh, the latest Twitter drama where uh, uh, what's his face uh, Zack Snyder posted that image of Batman eating pussy? Good for him. It's the best thing that Zack Snyder has ever done. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's pointless. Zack Snyder should direct a porno. Yeah, I, I'd watch his four and a half hour. With l- speed ramping. <laughs> his four and a half long hour uncut vision porno. <laughs> From visionary director Zack Snyder. <laughs> he could have callbacks to all his movies. Get some from 300, get some of the uh, Owls of Kahul in there. Do it, Zach. You can do it. We believe in you. I'll forget Army of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> what a piece of shit that was. What if he filmed a porno with the same super shallow focus <laughs> as Army of the Dead? <laughs> and all the dead pixels in the shots as well. And then people are like, what the hell is going on? I can't see anything. I, I would also like it if the porno had a uh, Tig Notaro really awkwardly just <laughs> CG. Being like, all right, everybody, good job. <laughs> just CG'd into the porno afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> They're clearly not in the same space. They yeah. just like cut away to her face. Oh, yeah. Great job. <laughs> a plus. Great sex, bro. <laughs> I'm sorry. See, that's just, I'm laughing at my own idea. Now. It's just funny to imagine Tignataro basically any movie just being like, oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll see you later. Pretending like she's talking to just anyone. <laughs> any movie. It's funny. And she's still the best part of that movie, which is the worst. <laughs> it's just such a weird touch. Yeah. But yeah, I think that would improve a lot of movies if you just had her randomly just being like, yeah. <laughs> no context either. Yeah. I got wearing a wig. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he lost a bet on the set. (laughs) (laughs) Right, you have to wear the share wig. Now, Max, have you ever killed someone? 
You're going to edit this out, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Um, so, a couple years ago, I was walking home. Um, yeah. And I saw this guy. And he's wearing a shirt that said he didn't like Reaper the Genetic Opera. Right. So, I had to... You had to kill him. I had to You had to do him. it to him, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is also me letting you know that your time is limited. Um, you only have like three more repo jokes before. Are you going to kill all our listeners too? I don't think there's a one of them that like that movie, Max. I disagree with that. At least four of them do. And I will stand by that number. And of course, like any good uh, mid to low budget movie, what Wilhelm, do you need? Wilhelm Scream. No. No movie needs that. What the fuck are you talking about? I'm talking about lighting people on fire. Yeah, that too. Has there, is there any movie that's ever been hurt by people being lit on fire? I don't think so. Try to think of one. You can't. Um, no movie is made worse by it. The 2000s Fantastic Four movies. Because the... Fire effects for the yeah, human, don't be cute. The don't human be cute. Torch Stupid just answer. looks terrible. What the fuck did you want me to answer? <laughs> the reality that lighting people on fire makes everything better. Now, Max, can I ask you something? Do you feel like this movie ever looks kind of like cheap? <sighs> cheap? No. Like you have an idea of what they're going for with, you know, the the sort of like uh, uh, cheaper spaces or whatever. But like, do you ever feel like the settings kind of look just like, ah, uh, whatever? Not, that's the thing, though. Like you figure there's a lot of times in movies where you're like you're stuck in this one location. And you're like, oh, fuck. And you can tell they're stretching. Oh, look, there's a dog. But you can tell they're stretching a budget sometimes in lower budget movies like this, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, this this looks like it was shot in a mall or whatever, but like. This is like, I'm, I'm sorry, but like, I don't get tired of the setting the entire time. Yeah, I'm not talking about like whether or not it's good. I'm just like talking about like aesthetically, you know? I think this movie at certain points does look cheap, but it actually kind of recruits that and it helps the movie. Yeah. Um, in a way that you wouldn't really expect because it's moments like when he's chasing the, the car at the beginning where you're like, okay, this is just a guy driving down a road. You know, it has echoes of like that best of the worst feel where it's like this just is so close to being an exploitation movie in some ways, you know? Um, but well, yeah, and the cheapness of it, like, if the sets look cheap, if the cops' outfits look kind of cheesy, like, it kind of just adds to the setting. Like, yes, this world isn't going to fucking pay for these elaborate buildings. Yes, the outfits are going to be super theatrical and dumb, but that's kind of the point as well. Yeah, and the thing about it, too, is, like, it's how it mixes with that sci-fi aesthetic, it's not just about whether or not it looks cheap. It's like, oh, this looks like something I would just walk into a mall and see something exactly like this today. I don't know when this movie takes place, but it's in the far distant future or whatever. Normally, you would expect there to be more some sort of change in design or something. But for them to just sort of be like, okay, we're just going into a mall, and it's very, very recognizably something just, just totally looks like today where they don't even have to change anything. It's kind of like... I think it really helps the aesthetic because, again, it's reinforcing that idea of, like, you know, what forces of this society have access to that utopian sci-fi technology and which ones are denied it. You know, it's not just that it's cheap. It looks like it's cheap for something that is from, our, like, our time period when this movie was released. It gives it an interesting feeling. And uh, I don't think it would work unless the movie was focused enough on that <laughs> outside of that, you know? It's one of those details that I think you can get away with because of how they're approaching the material.
Now, Max, do you have a favorite action scene in this movie? Uh, my favorite action scene? Um, we probably already went by it. It was... You know what? I was going to say the minigun scene, just because that's like such a big, fun spectacle. But I'm not sure if that counts as an action scene. That's more. Yeah, of a, I was going to say... That's more of just a spectacle. Just kind of runs away. I would then probably the drug lab shootout. I would say that that's very well done and expertly paced. And you do the, get that really good moment at the end yes. where Dredd is about to die, and I'm so glad they gave that to him. Yeah, I think this sequence is probably my favorite. That's the thing. Despite this movie, um, mostly trying to focus on action over some sort of plot, I don't think the action sequences are like especially strong. No, but they're fine. Yeah. It, it just goes to show that what this movie gets right is, again, having those physical props and dead bodies at the beginning to create a sense of, you know, uh, consequences and stakes for the action. And then also having the moment where uh, Cassandra confronts the wife of the person she just killed where you have emotional stakes as, as well. It makes the action a lot more impactful and it doesn't have to be the most amazingly choreographed thing I've ever seen. It's still compelling, you know? But with that being said, I do really like this moment where he just like explodes this guy's uh, Adam's apple. Yes. It's great, so good. Great effect, honestly. Karate chop. <laughs> oh, look at that. He just judo chops him. He fucking inverses his Adam's apple. <laughs> just, oh my God. It's so good. So good. And then we have to have Lady Cop take on other Lady Cop. Well, yeah, they're not going to shoot a girl. Come on. Only girls can shoot girls. Except for Mama, I guess. Yeah. We'll shoot her and we'll throw her out a window. I feel like if you were a high level, I, I don't know. This isn't a nitpick, but I like. Don't you think he would have known that like you can't fuck with a judge's gun without it exploding in your fucking hand? He's never touched one. I don't know. That's another unanswered thing about this where it's like. Clearly this gang is, uh, you know repurposing a certain amount of infrastructure in the building to suit their own needs that is actually controlled by the government, it seems. But we don't know how much of their technology or equipment actually is, like, stolen from the government, you know? Yeah. Um, they have all these guns, but... Again, they're just Gatling guns. Yeah, they shoot, like, red tracer bullets, but... <laughs> I don't know if that's, like, a particularly hard thing to find in this future world. They're not, like, magic, you know, like, pulse... Uh, I don't know, magnetic super weapons or something. <laughs> you know what else is interesting about this movie is how you get some of those weird camera movements, right? He presses the button and it's about to be like, you're about to die. And then it does this weird herky-jerky thing where the camera slides back to his face. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. You get a lot of shots like that in this movie where uh, they decide to just put the camera like, really close to someone's face and then have something else in like the background. I don't know. I don't know if there's a rhyme or reason for it, but uh, it's just kind of more visually interesting, I guess. Sometimes even if you don't have a clear motivation, it's more fun to just have a weird composition than to uh, just have everything sort of like, I don't know, neatly organized in the frame. Like this is a very stable well-composed frame. You got the person in the foreground, person in the background, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then you get other shots where it's like, like, like after they uh, beat up K in that classroom, <laughs> there's a shot of him and it's just like his mouth is like huge. And then the two judges are in the background. It's like, oh, it's kind of weird. Here we are in the drug factory. Interesting that they choose the production center for slow-mo as that, you know, the setting where Dredd is probably going to confront the uh, strongest 
representation of the contradictions in his ideology. My question, though, I wish I knew more about the comics for this because I don't know if this character Lex has any other like background to him. Is he older than Dread in this? Is that supposed to be the thing? Uh, I don't know. I do know slow mo was an invention for the movie. Okay, that's not from the comics. I think it's a fair, it's a fine addition. I'm, I'm always down for your fictional drugs. I mean, yeah, it, it works perfectly too with that super cock cop narrative you know if you want to choose something that's arbitrary and totally going to be revealing of like them acting out of pure ideological uh goals uh for the state choose narcotics because the criminalization of it is so often arbitrary and unnecessary and just serve some sort of uh you know evil um political goal <laughs> much like the criminalization of weed in the u.s right there's no reason to really criminalize weed is it dangerous no not really but we got to find a way to arrest people. Yeah. Well, it was first because we hated Mexicans, and then we realized we could uh, criminalize the hippie and the black civil rights movements by crim- heavily criminalizing weed. So That we could put them in jail and then have slave labor. Yep. They're not technically slaves, Max. No, they, they make, are. They make five cents an hour. The 13th Amendment forbids slavery for everything except... <laughs> oh, yeah, pun- they are legally slaves. Yeah. Everything except as a punishment for crime. Fuck yeah, they did such a good job on that. They did such a good job <laughs> injuring slaves. Good job, guys. You did it. So, Max, what do you think about the fact that we don't see any stratification of this society at all? We assume that there's some sort of stratification naturally, but we have no evidence of it. There's no traces of rich people or the good life in this city. All we see is this endless hellscape of all poverty. Yeah. The judge building is the only building that doesn't look like it was built 800 years ago and not decaying. But it also seems terrible. Yeah. Because it's just this disgusting fascist architecture. No, but I'm saying stupid cartoon eagle. (laughs) It's like the only thing that's like has money spent on it. Yes. We don't see a government. We don't know what kind of government, if any, this society has or if it's just run by the judges. The only trace of rich people that we see in this movie, Max, I don't know if you caught it. It's at the beginning where we get that news footage montage and you see a little ticker, a news ticker at the bottom that says like, don't let radiation ruin your vacation. (laughs) And it's this little ad for this, like, I don't know, made up resort that's like radiation resistant or whatever. That's the only trace of like money and affluence we have in this movie. Oh, and you can totally miss it. We have her character arc now. She learned to shoot first. (laughs) There you go. Good job, Cassandra. Of course, uh, speaking of Cassandra's character arc, I don't know if we've mentioned this. Should hopefully go without saying to our, all our listeners how on the nose it is to name her Cassandra, and have her be the character who's trying to make a difference, and she has these special psyop abilities that give her enhanced perception and sight. And of course, naming her Cassandra speaks to the futility of her trying to actually change anything as a judge. She's the one who can understand that people are victims, not perpetrators. And yet, because she is Cassandra, she will have no ability to actually change anything. And in fact, no one will listen to her or care. Now, Max, this might be the most interesting moment in the movie. For anyone who's not watching this along with us, we've reached the point where Judge Dredd has been shot by Lex, one of the traitor judges, and Judge Dredd, just before he's about to get his head blown off, puts his hand up and he goes, wait, wait. As if he's about to beg for mercy. And then Judge Dredd does this thing where he's like, he's turning it into a quip where he's like, wait for her to shoot you. Bad guy. But Max, the question is, is Judge Dredd actually scared for his life here? And does he just retcon this stupid quip? Yeah, that's the thing. Like, if he saw her there, 
<laughs> she she just learned to shoot first. So if she, if she was already there, I don't think she would have been like, oh, well, I'm going to let him finish his little villain's monologue <laughs> before I shoot him. It's only polite. Now we get the flesh sharpie. Yeah. I don't know, Max. I just, I genuinely think that's the most interesting moment of the movie. Because you have Dredd, who's a character that are, you know, really deliberately trying to distance from the audience and put up a wall between you and your ability to understand what motivates him. And I think that works really well. Uh, for the most part here. But again, that's one of those moments where they just allow the performance to sort of take over kind of effortlessly. And it, I just love that it gives you that question where it's like, the editing is key, Max, because it takes too long for her to shoot him to clearly say that she was behind him when Judge Dredd was like, wait, don't shoot me. Yeah. So it's this very interesting thing where it's like, Maybe Judge Dredd is, like, horrified of death. And like Lex is saying, the moment he's on the other end of the the wrong side of a gun, uh, he becomes this simpering, pathetic weasel, you know? And Carl Urban does this interesting thing with his uh, scowl where he kind of bends it a little bit more than you're used to. And it's like, wait, is he expressing fear or what's going on here? It's definitely a moment that I think if you could have gotten the same uh, creative team back together to do some sort of sequel in the same style, I would have been really curious to see that movie because it, you know, it that, a moment like that is something you can build on where you don't have to say it in the first movie, but like you have your stupid, uh, dirty, hairy, super fascist cop character uh, experiencing a moment of true terror and awareness of their own mortality um, and vulnerability. Which again, when we're talking about the performance of authority and violence is something that he can never allow himself to feel if he's going to be the embodiment of uh, this fascist state. He has to always be powerful, always be strong. So to be put in that position is like this very psychologically disorienting situation. It sucks that they couldn't get a sequel made to this movie. Although as far as I can tell, Carl Urban has always been a cheerleader for doing a sequel somehow. Yeah, he thoroughly enjoyed work or doing this movie. He seems to tweet about doing a sequel every like three weeks. Good for him. I, Carl Urban seems like a cool guy. I seem to have a memory of him like eviscerating someone on Twitter in a way that was funny. I always like it when like people are willing to insult each other on Twitter. I was going to say now that <laughs> Game of Thrones is over, Lena Headey could make another return, but I don't think that's going to happen somehow. What has she been doing lately? I don't know. She's just taking time off? Basking in Game of Thrones money. Why not? <laughs> Doesn't matter if the ending was shit, if you still get paid millions She's of dollars. She's talking to George R. R. Martin on the phone. I can tell why you're not working on that book. <laughs> or Elden. It's way more fun to just be in a jacuzzi. Or Elden Ring. <laughs> George R. R. Martin finished work on Elden Ring years ago. I don't know about that. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He finished on it years ago. He didn't have to write anything. He just came up with like, I don't know, like characters and stuff. I know if I had to hire him to do anything, I'd be like, you're going to finish your thing first and then we'll move on to the next thing. Cause I'm not waiting on you to finish anything. <laughs> If at the very least, because I might get assassinated by Game of Thrones fans who are like, you're getting in the way of his magnum opus. Well, that's the thing now. Like, I kind of respect George R.R. Martin because even though the end of like the Game of Thrones TV show was a fucking clusterfuck. Yeah. He basically had a multi-million dollar beta test for the ending of his books. He knows exactly not how to end it now. Do you think he was waiting for it to end specifically before he commenced with writing? Because I don't think the next book is the very last book, right? No, he had said, because people were asking him when the show was ending, why is it ending? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> I think they could have kept it going from the other three or four seasons. So I, like, he stopped writing for the show or stopped being a consultant on it around season five. And it really shows, like, the quality drops off very quickly. But I, I don't know. Even if he hadn't, even if they ended it the exact way that he wanted to, he now is no he now knows not to end it that way and can make everybody happy by just changing it. Yeah, he could just change it to literally anything. And people will be like, well, it's probably better than this. 
I just love the karma of those guys ending the show as quickly as possible so they can snag some Disney money and do some sweet Star Wars gig. And then because it's so terrible that they get that yanked away from them. Yes, it is. It is so delicious. (laughs) That's so amazing. Fuck you, stupid idiots (laughs) for doing that. Imagine being eager to work on Star Wars like that. Yeah. Do you want all the hate that J.J. Abrams gets on a daily basis? Come on, man. I mean, you do it for the money. Yeah. Because creatively, what does Star Wars have to offer? I Nothing. Th- I find it amazing that J.J. Abrams managed to like tank both of the most successful sci-fi series in the history of existence. What's up next on the list? J.J. Um, Abrams going to do his Solaris remake. 2001 A Space J.J. Awesome. Abrams is going to the, do the sequel to the new Dune movie that's coming out. <laughs> oh, there we go. It'll be so good. It'll have soy, soy banter. Exactly. It's going to be so good. Uh, a giant sandworm? Oh, God. I got to get a hot dog. Or whatever the fuck. It How could you get one hot dogs when there's the big one chasing us? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was on my mind. <laughs> now, Max. Moment of silence for Lena Headey. I was about to be thrown out a window in a reference to Hans Gruber. Die hard, clearly. Yes, uh, with less of the wacky waving our inflatable tube men effect. Yeah. Uh, I do appreciate the uh, the way it's a repetition of that hard, you know, um, die hard moment. Because die hard is such a seminal sort of cop action movie. And it's okay to explicitly reference it in this way when you're doing something this creative with it. You know? Um, also, I think- And when you're twisting the values of this moment so so much... It's like this moment, it's like, Tread is awful in this moment. Yeah. And we get this really beautiful moment where, like, Lena Headey, this is probably the most beautiful moment of the movie. Like, he didn't need to do this. He's won at this point. He's, like, taking Mama in is probably the better idea, honestly. This is probably my favorite shot of the movie. It is great. And from This what one. I, from what I understand, most of this was added in post-production and editing. It's just so interesting to have this idea of like we're entering Mama's subjectivity as she's falling to her death, and after um, you know it's a repetition of the thing she did at the beginning. But then also on her way down, she like bears witness to the fucking carnage and the bloodshed that we've we've sort of uh, seen throughout the rest of the movie. It's just very interesting. And again, it's the final moment of slow-mo in this movie. And what is it? It's it's this highly subjective experience where the camera becomes one with the character's perspective, but also it's a character's perspective of being completely destroyed by the state. Yes. In almost every slow-mo scene, with the exception of when she throws the people out of the uh, you know, off the balcony and they fall at the beginning, every other slow-mo scene where we get the slow-mo perspective, involves some sort of horrifying violence that is caused by the judges. And then you have the the super interesting ending where it becomes this kaleidoscopic um, sort of image uh, as she lands on the screen itself. And uh, we see the blood blood. splatter, yeah. Or the violence, the blood has truly become the spectacle of the film. Yeah, I just think it's really interesting how that moment of spectacle also reaches that um, self-awareness with, you know, hitting the screen. Uh, and the movie sort of tipping its hat and, like, acknowledging the the artificiality of the 3D and the aestheticization of that moment. Um, and then being a reference to, again, the most triumphant moment of, like, Die Hard, one of the most influential action movies ever. It's like... Is this really the echo of like that really triumphant, amazing moment where Hans Gruber is really defeated at the end? It's like, I don't know. Emotionally, I feel kind of bad <laughs> after seeing this. I mean, also, let's not forget, for anyone who's not watching this, Judge Dredd, when he threw her out the window, she had this heart rate monitor thing hooked up to a like a remote detonator for a bomb where if she got shot, she was basically holding the building hostage. She's like, there's 70,000 people here. If you shoot me and this thing detects that my blood, uh, my my, bl- my heart rate drops below a certain number, this bomb will detonate automatically. And Judge Red is like, you know what? I'm going to take my chances. I'm going to shoot you and throw you out this window. And hopefully the signal from your little uh, wristwatch here won't reach the bomb through 200 levels of concrete. If it does, uh, I've fucked everybody, including <laughs> yes. myself and my partner. But, but it- I don't care. 
And it just so happens he's lucky and it doesn't explode <laughs> and kill 100,000 people. Which would make him one of the worst killers in human history. <laughs> <laughs> or the worst killer that week we don't know how bad this universe is in this universe maybe not yeah yeah now max one thing we haven't talked about throughout this entire movie that i i feel like we should try to return to with other similar movies like this is this movie specific take on violence we talked about the consequences and it, you know the value of having like physical uh, elements to your violence where you have physical, you know, dummies or corpses that you can use physical blood splatter, um, because it, it really adds something to the stakes and, uh, you know, the emotional severity of what's happening, happening when people die or get hurt. Um, but also I think this movie has a specific approach to violence is very reminiscent to me of like Paul Verhoeven's approach to violence. And he's, he's definitely one of the best filmmakers when it comes to filming violence. Uh, Because he really understands, like, a specifically American way to, like, highlight uh, a character's relationship to violence in cinema. And I'm not quite sure what that ingredient is uh, to, to sort of approaching action and violence in that specific way and why his take on violence is so uh, satisfying but also horrifying. Um, but it's something that we should definitely try to pursue more in other movies like this, because it's definitely something this movie gets right. And I can't tell you what it is about it. Exactly. It's a specific emphasis on brutality on, um, you know, violence in support of like an ideology too, you know? Yeah. There's no, there's no pretenses about it being noble, even if it is aesthetically awesome. You know, when RoboCop blows people away, it's awesome. But also it's like, the movie doesn't pretend that he's doing a good thing <laughs> either. So it's very interesting the way he approaches that. And uh, I don't know, watching this movie, doing this movie, I feel very excited to do other kind of like, you know, super cop movies. I'd, I'd be down, honestly. This put me in a good mood and I'm I'm really glad that we did it. Yeah, because I what I've realized from doing this movie is how much that type of story relates to uh, so many other interesting creative elements, whether it's like different approaches on like cities and their portrayal throughout film, but also like just violence itself. Yeah. And the way to like ec- exercise violence upon a people. I don't know. It's just very interesting. But um, but it, the movie is already over max. Yeah, no shot by, but if you want to see us do more super cop movies or any other type of movie for that matter, you can check us out at spectatorfilmpodcast.com. We are on YouTube. Please check out our YouTube channel. That's relatively new. Uh, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else podcasts can be found. We got a letterbox. Yes, check our letterbox for movies that we have done and movies we're considering doing. And a Twitter and an Instagram. Yes. And Max has an OnlyFans, uh, yeah, as we remind you every week. That's only for our top tier Patreon donors. Um, no, you're con- you're confusing things. It's not Patreon, it's OnlyFans. I'm paying twice here. Yeah. OnlyFans no, is it's exclusive the, It's enough. that good of content. Oh, you have to pay on both. You have to, okay. you have to pay... Thank you.